today's topic is owner financing subject to and lease options. Um, every grid is usually different. We try to do about eight to 12 different subjects every, every year. I repeat a few, like I repeat the burr process because that's like my bread and butter. Um, I repeat uh, uh, the uh, uh, like how to es estimate and evaluate or do an estimate for an evaluation because people like that one a lot too. Um, but then the rest are all kind of new 1031s, creative financing. Oh. Hey, what's going on, man? Uh, and, and all that. So we're, we're, uh, today we're going to focus on creative real estate investing strategies using owner financing subject to and lease options. All right. So just to go over what's grid grid is a global real estate investor community built for investors by investors. We're not gurus. We're a group of real people doing real deals. That's the idea behind grid. Um, you know, I run Grid Delco, but there's like over a thousand grid communities around the world. So uh, that's what we are. Our mission is to connect, to learn from, collaborate with like minded people interested in building wealth and creating impact for real estate. Uh, welcome investors of all experience levels. Like you see, sometimes there's people with no deals, sometimes people with. I think the most I've had is someone with a little bit over a hundred units and have done a lot of flips. So we can really range. And like I said, there's over a thousand community, 2000 grid leaders. Uh, they kind of track what people have done through the grid community for a long time. Uh, so for me, uh, my name is Will Holder. I run the William Holder realty team and Remax classic out of Wayne, but I live here in Swarthmore. Um, I run this group, one, to get more people involved in real estate investing. I think it's a must if you're, you have to diversify your portfolio for retirement. Even if it's a little bit real estate, it should be some real estate. Um, but especially if you're in real estate at all, you should invest in real estate, especially for real estate agents, uh, lenders, anyone that's in that field, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, and I run it, one, to educate, two, to help people find deals, and help myself find deals. You know, I look to do flips locally. Um, I don't really buy rentals locally anymore just because of the cost to buy rentals in the market. But, uh, you know, I so if anyone ever has any good deals, want to talk about it, I'm here to help. Um, what do I want to accomplish? Is basically, one, educate, help people learn more about real estate and or real estate investing and to hopefully find deals in the future as well, right? Uh, connect with me through at William Holder Realty on Instagram or 610-657-6215 or will at William Holder Realty. So uh, we'll go around the room, just kind of find out a little bit about yourselves and you want to answer these questions? Yeah, start with you. My name is Casey Ross. I live in the city, uh, Fishtown section. I... I consider myself an investor. I have a single family rental um, that I've had tenants in for about three years now. Um, interested in acquiring more rental properties, either single family or multifamily, like probably one to four is where I am right now. Um, I'm definitely hoping to learn more about the topic tonight. Overall, just hoping to learn more about finding deals and. Um, I don't want to say secrets, but like strategies, like what are other people doing? You know, maybe get some mentorship uh, it's available. It's, I guess, also what I'm looking to mentor. Awesome. 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 Yeah, my name's Harry. Um, well, my first one's best on property in 1994. So I've been a landlord for 30 years. Um, I have some iron holes. I've done flips. Um, I bought an auction. Um, I bought a deed of real. Um, and recently, I did a wholesale deal, which won. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at this stage of the game, um, you know, always looking for a new deal. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You're local to Delco? Or... I am. Okay. I mean, cool. Awesome. Awesome. So you said you've done the uh, deed in lieu? Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Great. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe before the class is over because... Okay. Uh, never done one myself. Uh, important legal stuff. 
again, this is just for advice. Please don't sue us. Simple enough. Uh, we do record this training. It's going to be on our YouTube page. So if your voice or face is heard or seen, just so you know, could be done. Um, so let's start with talking about owner financing subject to and lease options. And there's a few others I'm going to throw in at the end that aren't mentioned in here, but uh, they're interesting. So these are three powerful tools you need to know and understand if you want to scale without a whole lot of money out of pocket. All right, what is owner financing? Owner financing is when the seller finances all or part of the real estate transaction. I actually was looking at a deal today in, I thought I'd remember the name of this place. Um, it was like Clayton, Pennsylvania or some a town like that. And they, they had on there that the seller would finance, at, they'd be willing to find, finance more than 50% of the deal. It was like a $1.2 million apartment building that they bought and gutted and I think they just tapped themselves out and they're trying to get out of it. Um, so they're out there. You know, I see the verbiage, especially with where the interest rates are now. If you were a home uh, investor that bought a property in 2020 through 2020, I mean, even before 2020 when they were five and a half percent, but 2020 through 2022, you're buying at 4%. And if it's an arm, like a 3-1 or a 5-1, you're starting to worry because that's going to come up soon. And that property that was doing okay at 4%, not going to do so great at 8%. So you're thinking, how do I get out of this? So a lot of these owners uh, are willing to get creative with what they're willing to do to help you purchase the property. Also, also what happened there? Also, if uh, I had a glitch once, I don't have a glitch. A real person. Yeah, I think so. We had this crazy thing happen, uh, like our second grid meeting. Uh, I had, you know, like eight, ten people in the room, and like five on the Zoom. And I'm listening, and I had my ear pod in, and I'm hearing this weird noise. And I kind of see everyone look up, and I turn around and look. And right before it happened, some a pop up would come up saying Zoom is trying to enter your chat. I was like, Zoom is trying to enter your chat. You know, so I hit no. And I guess that was like a virus or someone trying to get in, but it was just like the most graphic like pornography video came up. Uh, yeah. I was like, oh my God. It was funny, but uh so I'm always worried that's gonna happen again. Uh anyway. Yeah, there's something like this that was Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I actually like screenshot and sent it to my friends. They were cracking up, but uh, yeah. So, um, uh, if you're a a prop a person that owns a property, let's say outright, right, and you're trying to sell it in this market, and if you're evaluating a multifamily property, especially an apartment building, you're looking at cap rates. And you're also looking at your net operating income. You're looking at what you're actually walking away with. If you're factoring in a mortgage at 9%, 8% at the price most of these sellers want to sell them for, you're walking away with close to nothing, right? You're getting paid nothing to manage a giant property. So a home, a, a, a smart home seller or apartment seller can say, look, I'll carry the loan for you at 5%. I'll carry your down payment. I'll carry a portion of it so that this property is more profitable for you. And I get it on my end as well. I get my price. All right, so we'll go over the pros for the seller. But pros for the buyer are, it's a fast way to close. Obviously, a buyer doesn't have to go through a lengthy home loan process or investment property pro loan process. Doesn't mean the seller isn't going to vet you. You know, if they're a smart seller, which they probably are if they own a building with that much equity in it, they're probably going to want to, have someone pull your credit. They'll probably do a background check. They might want to see some assets. Like they'll probably do some homework, but it's not going to be a multi-layered underwriter, loan officer, underwriter, uh, manager approval type deal. You know, it's going to be a simpler underwrite process from just them. They might have their attorney look at it. Uh, the ability to purchase a home with less than perfect credit. Again, banks, you know, even hard money lenders, they all have 
tiers, right? They all have certain levels they're looking for of experience, certain levels of credit, and they base the risk on that. And some of them have cutoff numbers like, hey, we won't lend to people under a 700, a 680, a 640, a 580. With a individual, you are able to have that conversation versus just being a number, right? So that's another benefit of, you know, a pro for you as the buyer. And then there's usually lower closing costs. Banks charge a lot of money to close. They have to pay everyone that's working on that loan, right? So they usually build that into your closing costs. For the seller and people, a lot of people ask like, what is the biggest benefit? To me, the tax liability is the biggest benefit because yes, it's a fast way to close for the seller. They get to offload the property. Uh, but also if you're a seller and you're, it's an investment property, you're not 1031ing that money into something else. You're, when you sell that property, you're going to hit capital gains, right? If you do it over a loan, you get to spread out that capital gain over the amount of time that loan hits. So it actually lessens your tax burden significantly. And I recommend it to some sellers that they have the option to do it, especially if they're trying to sell multiple properties at once to figure out how much your income is going to end up being, your taxable income. If you could find a way to spread that out by doing seller financing, it's a great option for you. Um, so not only are you making money on the interest, but you're saving money on the taxes. The net gain is huge, right? Um, a seller can command a higher price as well, right? Because interest rate compares to the market. Like I just said, if you're trying to sell your property and the rates are 4%, great. But if the rates are currently what they are or what they were six months ago, which was like nine and a quarter, nothing worked, right? Like you could, uh, properties that are listed for, you know, I'm looking at like 26 unit buildings at 1.5 million that make no sense. You think, well, 26 units, 1.5, that's not that bad. But when you factor the mortgage payment, they're, you're bringing home nothing, like four grand a year. That's after everything. It's nothing. So as a seller, you say, hey, I'll offer you 5%. And uh, mortgage lenders are getting smart with this. So I work with a mortgage lender with through like movement mortgage. And what they do is they'll go to home, they'll go to home building contractors, right? And they'll say, hey, if you purchase a block of money, at a certain interest rate, will allow you to shop that to your clients at 5%, right? But you have to pay the buy down early on, right? So they'll sell them that block, you know, whatever the amount of finance is, $10 million or whatever at 5%, but that more, that more, the, the builder is paying a large buy down fee. What's the benefit to them? Well, they get now get to put up a sign that says, if you buy this house, we can get you a 5% interest loan. And guess what? The property sells. That's why would people buy them at 8% when they could buy them at five? So if you're a builder in an area that's slowing down, you know, that's a mortgage company helping a builder slash owner get people to buy their properties through lower financing. Right. So it's similar concept, a lot less. Let's say builder specifically talking about construction professional or somebody like just anybody who's going to build it. Right? Yeah, you could do it yourself as an individual. So I have, uh, we have, there's lenders that, let's say you were going to list your home in a market that might not be as desirable or the market slowed down or the rates are 9% or whatever. You could say, you can go to a, a lender that's offering this. I know a couple that do and say, I want to buy down a rate to a certain amount. Now they're not going to let you buy it down to zero, but they'll let you buy it down pretty significantly, maybe close to 5%, right? Is it going to cost you? Yeah, but it now makes your house more marketable, right? Because if that house was an $800,000 house at a 5% interest rate, that payment's more affordable to a lot more people than $800,000 at 9%, right? And versus reducing the price significantly, you pay, might cost you ten dollars or $15,000, but that could be the difference between you getting eight hundred and seven fifty dollars dollars or even seven hundred, dollars right? So- it, you can do it as just an individual as well. Don't actually have to be a builder. All right, so the owner financed a property earlier this year that I owned free and clear. I owner financed. I received multiple offers. This is an example. It's not mine. I received multiple offers, had some traditional financing, and others wanted me to be the lender. 
I chose an offer that was 20% above the rest, above the best traditionally financed option. The buyer put down 20% and I agreed to finance the balance over five years at 6% interest amortized over 30 years. So as you can see in this example, it's basically a buyer did their homework, hopefully did a lot of math, and they figured out that they can beat out the competition by getting the seller to finance it at a much lower rate than they can get on the market. What that buyer is doing, though, is they're banking on interest rates being lower in the next five years, right? Remember, a five-year, uh, it's a five-year loan amortized over 30 years, which means after five years, it balloons. As, as a, a payback at that point that's due. You're hoping as the buyer that in that five years, you can either find the market rate for that amount or lower. Uh, if not, when it comes time to refinance or pay off the initial loan that's owed to that seller, you might be going into a higher interest loan, which could put you upside down, right? So it's a risk, but this person was able to actually get the property if they really wanted it. It's a smart way to get it. So as a owner, financer, you want to have an attorney draft up a promissory note and have a title company handle everything else. It's really not that difficult. I know attorneys that'll do these for like $1,700. They're not super expensive. They're not cheap, but it's still cheaper than a lender. There's probably cheaper attorneys out there. I just know a good one that'll do them for that. Uh, what is subject to? So this is the other strategy. Buying a home subject to means buying a home subject to an existing mortgage. Essentially, the buyer assumes the current mortgage payments in exchange for the deed of the house. You may be saying, wait, why would the seller do that? Well, typically it's because they are motivated to get the payments and the property off their hands, right? So subject to pros for the seller, it solves a problem they have, which is a mortgage they can't afford probably, or uh, it's an estate. Someone passed away. They're the executor of the estate. No one's willing to pay them what the property is worth. They don't want it to go into foreclosure, but it has a really good interest rate on that loan. Maybe it's a loan that was a 3% loan, right? So why wouldn't they let you assume that loan? So it the payment goes away and uh, you're holding on. You're making the mortgage payments for them. Uh, it gets them the money they need, but typically in a delayed fashion. So again, the plan is to buy the property. You're just holding it subject to the mortgage for the time being. And it can help them build back their credit or do whatever they need to do. Pros for the buyer. Buyer does not need to get a traditional financing. Uh, they own the house and they can build up the equity based on uh, the amortization schedule. So this isn't an assumable loan. What this is, is an attorney creates a trust and they will put the actual mortgage in that trust. It still stays on the seller's credit. So the bank never knows that the ownership transfers. That's the trigger, right? A lot of, pe a lot of people... They're worried, and you should be, if you transfer the, the deed of the property when you have a mortgage, your bank gets a notification because they're recorded as a lien holder, and they're like, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? That person needs to get a loan and pay us off. With this, it's kind of a backdoor. They transfer that deed, that mortgage into a trust, and you are, you being the person that's assuming it's subject to, uh, that mortgage is in charge of that trust. So you're paying the mortgage, you're making sure everything is still handled, um, but the loan actually still stays in that person's name. So risks, technically the lender can call the note due, but it's been our experience they won't as long as the note remains current. Again, they're not being triggered usually because it's in a trust, but if they find out, the risk is if they're being paid, they're never going to look into it, right? That's the way it works with mortgages. You pay, you stay, you don't, they take it. So if a lender has no red flags, no reasons to look into a file, payments are still coming in, they're not going to look into if that deed was transferred into a trust or not. Uh, 
mitigating risk. So a buyer can mitigate the risk by forming a trust that matches, I just talked about it, matches the seller or property name and serving as a trustee so they control, okay? so that uh, they can retain control. So this is the whole idea of the trust is if the trust is in the name of the buyer or it's the same name of the buyer, the bank doesn't know or question it because it's in a trust. Would you say the strategy is in traction right now with the mm -hmm. interest rates? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always been like these. These have always been around, and people that are in the know use them. But now with you know social media and all the investor gurus out there, like it's these things are getting really popular, especially with what recently happened with interest rates. It's even more so popular because we just did this big dip and now we're back up so much so that everyone that fixed themselves into a low rate in 2020 through 2022, mid 2022, uh, doesn't mean those people don't have problems, you know, like, yeah, you could have gotten a two and a half percent interest rate, but you also could have lost your job in late 2022 or recently uh, or gone through a divorce and tapped out the equity in that property or just uh you know have a squatter can't get them out whatever the situation is and you want someone to take it over without and you can't sell it on the regular market you know um so uh this example the seller wanted 50k cash quickly and he wanted me to assume the payments my plan was to renovate the house and list it two months later so instead of having to get hard money to close the deal, I used the underlying debt, which had a low interest rate and was and was 10 years into the amortization schedule. Amortization schedule. We drafted the paperwork and I recorded the interest and I recorded my interest. Three months later, I sold the house, paid off the underlying debt, pocketed 50, win-win. So what this, this example is, is this person wanted to flip it subject to. They didn't want to buy the property and then pay to close on it and then flip it. So what they said to the seller was, okay, you want money quick. This house is a mess. You have a mortgage on it. Let me put the mortgage into a trust. I'll take over the payments. I'll use my own money. However, they got that money. They could use a private lender. You know, some not, it wouldn't be a traditional mortgage lender because they, they wouldn't be able to record a lien on it. So it'd be private lender or their own cash, their 401k, their, you know, from whole life insurance policy, whatever they get their money from, they fixed it up, they listed it, they sold it. It's still sold in the trust, the original owner, whatever whatever deal they had with them, they gave them their share and they took their share of the profit. So it's a fairly, if you know, if you do the paperwork correct, a quick way to do a flip without going through the process of actually owning the property. The other benefit to that is you skip over an entire transfer tax, right? Like if with the same with the wholesale, if you're if you're not if you're not transferring the deed a bunch of times for you to buy it and then for you to sell it again, there's two transfer tax you completely missed, actually three technically. So which adds up, especially in the city of Philadelphia, where a transfer tax is four point two eight percent. Um that could be a lot of money, right? I, see that. I am too. I am too. I don't know. I think that's the one, you know, where they get you. It's always on the taxes, right? Uh, we, I had a contractor screw me years ago and it didn't matter because it wasn't big enough for, let me shut this door. Yeah, it didn't matter because it wasn't big enough for the local police or anyone to care, the DA, and they knew what they were doing by doing it in multiple uh, townships. But years later, I got a call from the Revenue Department for New Jersey, which is where their business was registered, because they didn't pay taxes on any of that money. They screwed all these people out of. And I'm pretty sure he went to jail for it, like we testified or gave him whatever. So, uh, but it's the same thing with wholesales with subject to states, townships, cities are going to start doing the math pretty soon and realizing how much money they've lost over the years. And I, 
interested to see what happens, you know? So. All right. So most subject to deals are held for longer periods of time and in many instances for years, but this example gives you an idea of what's possible, right? So, you know, the flip version of a subject to isn't super common, but it's used. And if you can find a good enough deal to make it work, it can be a great, great, great option for you. But most of the time people are using subject to to buy and hold properties, right? Um, yeah. And if you're a better landlord operator than the person that has the property, you know, they see it as a, as a disaster. They might have a holdover tenant. They put someone terrible in there that is a squatter or ruining the place. If you know what you're doing, you take it off their hands. They still get their more their mortgage paid. Maybe you're saying, "Hey, I'll give you a hundred dollars of the rent every month, or whatever your deal is with them." And then you manage it correctly, get that tenant out, put a good one in, you know, or get them under the right lease, you know, and make sure they're managed correctly. And you raise the rents. All of a sudden, you own a property that you're solving a problem for someone. You're making money, and really didn't have to do much in terms of your finances. Option three is what is a lease option? So uh, lease options are pretty straightforward to understand. It's basically a rent to own program. Uh, this just a heads up rent to own. I used to get the question all the time early in my real estate career. And it was pretty common post the 2008 house crash, like that whole thing with the mortgage, you know, with, uh, with, with mortgages and the housing crash, a lot of people were doing rent to owns because, People had issues that happened with their mortgages. They had a lot of foreclosures, things like that. And it was tough to sell houses. So homeowners were like, let's just do a rent to own to get someone in here and get the house sold. Now it's very uncommon. I don't see it ever like in the MLS. I, you know, you, you Google it. I have people call us all the time on our rentals. They're like, do you happen to know any rent to own? So I'm like, good luck. You know, I don't see it. It's really, really not that uh, common. It's something you have to propose and as a landlord that's looking to sell their property or a homeowner that's looking to sell your property, why would you do it? You're still going to, you're going to crazy prices for these houses. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And you're also risking a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, when that rent to own contract is up, the values is less. Right. So uh, it's not super common right now. Uh, yeah. Um, so the pros for the tenant buyer are the ability to work towards owning or home ownership, build up equity in a rising market and lock in price and terms. Pros for the seller landlord is they pass the maintenance issues onto the tenant. They lock in a great price and terms and they collect a, a sizable non-refundable deposit. So in terms of what, uh, what a lot of sellers will do, and I have one rent to own right now that I'm one of my tenants is doing. You get a large deposit. You basically get most of their down payment money. So like this property is a commercial property. They're going to need 25% when they buy it. I got 20% as the down payment. And the rent is inflated so that not only am I getting rent, but I'm also getting enough to put away on top of that for him that when he's ready to purchase or when the lease is up, he'll have the 25% he needs. You can structure it however you want. That's just the way this one was structured. And it's the way I felt the best about it. And the great part is, is this person was in this property for a long time before I ever bought it. It's in disrepair. He wanted to do the repairs. I'm like, great. The lease, it's kind of like a triple net lease if you ever do commercial real estate where they're responsible for everything. So he's responsible for the maintenance, the updates, the utilities. Just be careful. Like Philadelphia, you don't want your tenant responsible for water because that's leanable. So I didn't give him that responsibility. But the other ones that aren't leanable, I gave him those responsibilities and, you know, it, it's kind of hands off out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, these contracts are pretty ironclad. Like if he doesn't, if he isn't able to perform, I could keep the deposit. I could keep the money. Right. So I don't want that. I don't kind of defeats the purpose. And now I have a pissed off squatter in my property. So I hope that doesn't happen, but these contracts are, you know, are good. Um, 
So there are uh, normally two contract types for lease options, a rental contract and an option contract. Uh, the option contract normally has a date and time frame by the tenant buyer needed to purchase the home with traditional financing. Uh, because of the added flexibility of timing, with timing of closing, you can normally charge more than typical market rents, which is something people do, and a tenant buyer will pay over market rents, a larger deposit, and over market purchase price for financing flexibility. Uh, now and close later. So you're saying to someone two years ago, they had a foreclosure, but they have a good job. Their credit is just impacted and they want to get their kids into whatever school district, maybe the one they were in before the foreclosure. You look at their credits moving in the right direction. They say, Hey, I will pay you. You're asking three grand rent for that house. I'll pay you four per month, and I'll give you a sizable deposit with the option to purchase it after a year, because I know after the third year of a foreclosure, I can go get an FHA loan as a homeowner, as a buyer. Great, why wouldn't I take that deal? Because you're giving me a lot more in market value. You're giving me a big deposit, which I probably wouldn't have gotten from a tenant. From a tenant, I would have gotten one or one and a half months rent. This person, I'm getting like five or 20% as a deposit, and they're going to probably pay you over market value. They're willing to say, hey, along with this lease, here's an agreement that your house is listed for 525, I'll give you 575 when it's over, right? If you could find a scenario like that and you can structure it, great. Problem is in most of these markets that that scenario would have worked pre-COVID or pre the housing boom, uh, that seller is gonna get 575 on the market anyway, right? The only plus there is that they get the increased rents. So again, always run credit check and check landlord references. You want to treat this like a normal rental when evaluating the tenant or purchaser. Uh, tenant slash buyer should always be responsible for all repairs and maintenance as if they own the home already. Again, the intent is to convey ownership, right? So you want them to treat the house like they own it, okay? <clears throat> you need to collect as large of a, a deposit as possible. Again, think down payment on the purchase. So with my scenario, I knew he was going to be having to get a commercial loan. There's no way I could really charge enough in rent to get 25% down of this property and, and still afford it. So I got a bigger deposit up front. If it's a situation like the first one I explained where it's FHA, that person is going to need three and a half percent down to buy. I would get that as the down payment, right? Um, uh, and you do have to be careful with that. Make sure you talk to their lender because money coming back from the landlord to the tenant can be seen as a gift from an unrelated party. And when you're in traditional financing, that's iffy it's actually not allowed in a lot of cases so just make sure you have a discussion with the lender how to structure that before you know you go about doing it and money could be held in like a specific account or something like that um uh, a portion of the monthly rent can go towards closing costs you know if they close on time so again that's similar to giving a seller's assist right if you're putting a portion of their uh their rents because you're charging more in rent towards their closing costs, you can give that to them as an assist at the closing table. And then uh, have a lender ready to help the tenant and buyer get qualified. So this is the other side of this. Make sure you pair them with a lender that knows what they're doing, that understands what needs to be done to get their credit back. Because if you just rely on the tenant to do it, they're not going to be as you're not having to hold their feet to the fire. Whereas it's your lender. They agreed to work with, you know, what's going on throughout the entire time. Um, auto draft payments, if possible, perform regular inspections, just like a typical rental. Uh, the tenant may have, may have right to decorate as desired, but must get permission for structural changes. Mm -hmm. So if the tenant and buyer, this is an example, 
can't close in time, extension costs, uh, additional deposits, and possible renegotiation of the purchase price and monthly rents. Uh, defaults or changes or changes their mind. You keep the deposits, re-rent, and begin the process again. Doesn't even or does eventually qualify and exercise the option. You will lose your rental, so price accordingly. Right, meaning when they do qualify, you're now losing a rental property, right? Because you're selling this to them. So we'll just make sure it's worth it to you to actually sell that rental property when you're giving them that price for the purchase option. Would it make a big difference if you inflated rent as well? Yep. 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 And on top of the deposit. So you get a deposit and inflated rent. Yeah. Uh what we want to what we want you to take away from this discussion is that there's a number of options available to buyers and sellers that are often overlooked. And the more familiar you are with these concepts, the more valuable you become to the market. All right, so there's a few more I want to add in to um, to this as well. This was kind of the standard ones, but um, so financing options. In addition to these, uh, you can get creative if you're just talking about from the residential perspective. Uh, as a regular person under your own name, you can buy with an FHA loan up to a four-unit property if it's going to be your primary residence. Right. And that number in some areas goes well over a million dollars, depending on the average price for that area. In Philadelphia, for a four unit, I think you can go up to 900,000 with an FHA loan and VA as well. But I think VA only allows up to two units. Um, after that, you can still buy a duplex with a 5% down conventional loan. Right. So if you're a young person or, you know, on a single person and you don't have a primary residence, you can find a four unit building, put three and a half percent down, get a seller that says to pay most, if not all of your closing costs. Because with FHA, you can get a 6% seller's assist. Live in one of those units and rent out the other three. And you now own a building for three and a half percent, which is awesome, right? Um, and that could be a pretty expensive building. It doesn't have to be. You could find, if you could find a four unit in Delaware County for under 500,000, you're lucky. But if you find it, great deal, right? Because if the rents make sense, that's the other thing you want to evaluate to make sure when you move out and you insert that fourth renter, you're now cash flowing, right? Uh, you don't want to break even property just because. You don't have that much equity in it to begin with. So if it's just breaking even and you want to offload it, you're kind of stuck with it, right? So you want to make sure when you outsale, when you when you move out of that fourth unit, the rent you're going to get in that fourth unit is now profit, right? You want to try to get the three units to cover your expenses, okay? Uh, now that's not super easy with 8 7% interest rates, 8% interest rates. So there might be a seller out there that's sitting on a four unit that is saying, man, I can't get what I wanted for it, but there's an owner occupant type that will pay them because the seller might be able to finance it for 5%, right? So that's FHA option. Now, after you do that, you live there for a while, you can go to a bank and say, hey, I don't like living here anymore. I wanna buy a two unit with a 5% down conventional loan. Thanks, say fine. Makes sense. We'll do it. Again, you can get a 3% seller's assist on that. So now you've bought six units for 3.5% and 5%. 8.5% total. You've bought six units with, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Um, and then after that, you can go buy your primary residence. But you've kind of tapped out your ability to use that FHA conventional structure. The first property you bought, if there's now enough equity, you can go refinance it into a conventional loan or a commercial loan, get it out of your name. You can do it all over again, right? You don't have to buy that first property with just an FHA loan. You could do what's called a 203K, which is a renovation mortgage, right? Now, these are all 
conventional products, meaning they're in your name. They're not in an LLC. So you can get a, a FHA 203K, which allows you to build in your renovation costs. So you find a fixer up for four units somewhere you, for a decent deal, good enough deal. You get the seller to pay 6% towards your closing costs. You get a 3.5%. You put your 3.5% down. You fix it up. You live in one of the units for a while. You make sure it's cash flowing. There's probably a good amount of equity because you bought it as a deal and you did the work responsibly, um, but efficiently. And now there's a good amount of equity in it. A year later, you can go to a bank and say, I think I have enough equity to refi this. Maybe you don't have 25% equity, but maybe you have 10%, you know, and you can lessen your PMI. You can get into a conventional loan. And now you no longer have an FHA loan on your credit. The only rule with FHA is that you can only have one at a time, right? And as long as you're able to prove that you're going to live in that building. So there are people that play that game for 10 years and stack up a lot of units, right? Because uh, they do it over and over and over again. So isn't after like three years you can get an FHA loan? No, you can you can get an FHA loan. The minute it's like in we have situations where like a, a seller a, wants to sell their house and buy another house, but they have an FHA loan on this house and they want to use an FHA loan to buy the other house. The day of closing, they no longer have an FHA loan on the first house. They can buy it immediately with another house. So the only rule is you can only have one FHA loan at a time, right? But it's got to be your primary, right? Now, there's people at risk not living there, which, okay, like that's your risk. But if the bank finds out, they can call the loan back, right? So it's a risk. Um, that's on the regular side, on the conventional side. The other thing to know, too, is banks won't let you have more than 10 loans, mortgages on your name, on your credit. There's a limit to it, Freddie and Fannie, one of those. There's a limit. So you can buy properties under your name, but when you hit the 10th one, that 10th mortgage, they won't let you do it anymore. So there's a cap to it, which is why it doesn't make sense to buy properties under your own name, right? Um, and also just from risk perspective, it doesn't make sense to buy properties under your own name. But you're limited to how many financed properties you can have under your name. Um, so that's on the regular side. On the commercial side, they it's kind of the wild west when it comes to commercial loans. So I'll give you an example of a loan we did where I bought a property in Lansford, that, which is like near the Poconos. And it was sitting for a while. And I said to the seller, hey, I like this property, but it needs, they were asking 190,000 for it or something. And I said, it needs like 50,000 in work. If I buy it, would you give my contractor $50,000 to do renovations post-settlement? Like on the settlement sheet, you can have a credit to this contractor for $50,000. And this seller said no, but eventually they said yes, because it sat for a while. In the commercial world, you can do that. So at closing, yeah, I brought my 25% down and I brought my closing costs, but I immediately got a check for 50 grand to my contractor, which is also a company I own, right? It's the commercial world. They don't look into that stuff. They don't even ask you where the money's coming from. Like I've never had a commercial lender ask me for proof of funds on for my down payment or closing costs. They just know that you're showing up to the table with it. So it's a whole different game when you're playing the commercial world under LLCs with those lenders. Uh, you know, a lot of the times when we structure deals, I'm going to a bank for 80% of the purchase price and 100% of the renovation. And I'm going to a private lender for my 20% down, my closing costs and my holding costs. So I have two loans, one with the bank and one with the private lender no money out of my pocket. Yeah, I'm paying two mortgages, but I know when I flip it or I refinance it, I'm going to be able to pay off those first two. And it's now profitable enough to cover that mortgage payment. So, and you can do that. People do that all the time in the commercial world. They use private funds to cover their cash out of pocket.
um other creative means that's some of the methods i've used and i've seen our clients use uh i know i've heard of a bunch more but those are probably the, the major ones that i see people use quite often um yeah all right questions so do you go into deals with these types of financing in mind or just certain types of deals lend themselves to these types of like how do you what's the shape of what's the egg? So to me it's I'm I have a pretty you have to figure out what your buy box is, right? My buy box is simple. I want it to be in Pennsylvania for now, just because I'm licensed in PA. Uh, I know the laws, I know the regulations, I feel comfortable working as a landlord, realtor, owner in Pennsylvania. So it has to be in PA. Number two, I don't want to pay more than $25,000 per unit. So if I'm looking in an area like here, it doesn't work, right? I'm not getting anything for 25 grand per unit around here. So if I'm, that doesn't mean the purchase price starts there, but if I see that it's, 35,000 per unit that they're asking. I'm trying to figure out how I can get it for 25 or less, right? Because I need to justify why I'm offering that amount. Um, but if they're offering asking 75 per unit, then I, we're probably too far and it doesn't make sense for me to look at that deal, right? To evaluate it much further than they're just asking too much than I than I want to pay. Um, and then after all expenses, after I've burned out of the property, I want to be cash flowing at least a hundred dollars per door per partner. So if there's two partners, two hundred dollars, three partners, three hundred dollars, I want that number in mind. So after I look at everything, what my new mortgage is going to be after I refinance out of this thing in a year or two, uh, what my taxes are, what the insurance is, what are all my utilities, what are all my expenses, what are uh, my five percent vacancy, five percent. Um, CapEx, 10% property management, uh, one month holdback on each. So I overestimate property management because what people don't factor into property management is, yeah, they're charging 10%, but then they're charging a month's rent when it goes vacant, right? So you have to build that in because then that's a lost cause you didn't think of or lost costs you didn't think of. So overestimate all those things after everything and my mortgage is paid. If I'm not hitting that hundred dollars per door per partner number, it's not either not worth it to me or I have to offer significantly less. And so that's kind of like my buy box. Now yours could be different. You could say I want to make four hundred dollars after everything. Good luck. It's tough to make that with today's numbers. But if you could find it, great. Uh, you might say I don't want to buy in Pennsylvania. You know, I want to buy in Delaware. Like, you know, figure out what your comfort zone is where you want to be for me it doesn't have to be near me i'm okay with buying in pittsburgh or out there as long as because i have property managers out there now like i understand the market out there but it's just kind of like what your comfort zone is um and scale up slowly you know like it'll happen it's a snowball effect like you'll start with a really tiny one and then it'll take you a while and take all your bruises on that because you know smaller the deal the less hopefully the less bruises you take and then let it build up and take more risk as you get bigger and can afford it. Um, but uh, that's kind of how I look for it. And yeah, so I'm sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there to answer your question better. Yes. If there is a deal that makes sense, if I structure it a different way, then yes, I'll, I'll propose it. So, you know, if, it looks okay, but it's not fitting. Then I'll say, hmm, I wonder if the seller finances this for 5%, can this work? You know, or at least 50% of it at 5%, can it work? Kind of just run through those scenarios to see if that will make this a viable project or a viable property. And if so, then I'll propose it, right? Because the seller might, from me, if I'm finance it, get 750, but if they finance it, they, they get 950, right? And that, there's a big difference. It could be that big of a difference. 
it's typically only an option if the seller owns it outright. If they don't have a mortgage, they don't own it. It's the that's the the proper way to do it. Yeah, is uh is that, but it's not the only way. Like you could kind of you combine some of these principles, so you can do the subject to where you put the the first mortgage in a trust, and then you have the seller finance a secondary uh, to, because you can't go finance the secondary yourself. So maybe the seller has enough that they can pull out of another property or enough and in, in, in enough capital, they can give you a secondary loan for you to make the capital improvements you want to make to the property before you refinance it out. What else? Nothing? Come on, there's more. More? Anyone? Oh. Oh. Hi, I had a question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> can you speak to a blanket loan strategy and when that would be a viable strategy to use if you have properties, investment properties? Sure, absolutely. So, and great question. Thank you for asking. Um, it, it, if you're, so for instance, like the, 10 mortgage rule on your own individual credit. If you have 10 mortgages and you want to start over and you want to keep buying under your name, you can get a blanket mortgage, pay off and combine all of those properties into one mortgage. And now you don't have 10 mortgages anymore. You have one and you could start over. So that's on the regular residential side. That's an example of how that can work for you on and, and this could also work on the commercial side, very similar way too. I'm actually in the process of doing one right now where one of our LLCs has like six properties we bird through and they're fully functional. They're great. They're doing well. They're cash flowing. And I have like 25, 30% equity in all of them, but combined, you know, that number is a lot bigger, right? So we're going to a bank and we're saying, Hey, uh, appraise all of these properties, clump them into one mortgage. And now instead of them being worth individually 150, 250, 350, together they're worth 1.5. And I have, you know, 30% equity on that. So that's 400,000 or something like that for something. Um, I can now go to this bank and say, hey, I have this blanket mortgage and I have $400,000 in equity. Would you give me a line of credit on that 400000 Not the whole amount, but maybe half of it. So now I'm getting to pull out some of the equity without actually having to pull it out because I've clumped it and I can use that to invest again, right? So the, the blanket strategy is to clump properties together to either get you more value or allow you to be able to buy more or accelerate your, your financing. The risk is... Banks, when you put properties in a blanket mortgage, they don't like you to sell them off individually. They'll charge you pretty high penalties if you try to do that because now you're for forcing them to pull that out of the portfolio and weaken the loan essentially. So they charge pretty high penalties, like really high. I had a, we had a client earlier this year that did that. He had like six properties in Reading and he was trying to sell them individually and the bank was trying to charge him like a $26,000 penalty or something. It was pretty crazy. Um, now he, I don't think he did a great loan. It was probably wasn't the best lender he did this loan with, but there are, there's a downside to it for sure. So you want to make sure you're, you're hold, you're going to hold these properties more than likely, or if you're not, you're going to sell them as a package. And um, you said that's with an LLC, um, the, the latter part of your statement um, sure. that you're doing is with an LLC. So are the are the lending um, criteria as, as far as what the underwriter looks for, is it as stringent as if you would do it versus the residential side, if you would do it? Yeah. So yeah. The, so the good thing the good about this is uh, they, the, the, the bank is usually looking at the portfolio. Do they look at you as the co-signer for the LLC? Sure, the guarantor. They look at you and like if you have two partners on an LLC, they're going to want to see your, they are going to pull your credit. They're going to want to see your income. They're going to want to see your assets, but it's not as heavily weighted on you. Like you could have lesser credit. You could have lesser income because 
if those properties are profitable, that's all the bank cares about. That's their major concern is that if you were to default on this, are they inheriting a good asset that they can sell? And if the answer is yes, more than likely they'll do the loan. So, uh, but yes, it's uh, under LLCs, they do look at less uh, and banks are willing to take more risk um, because they're not as, they're not under it as strictly as they would with your regular uh, uh, control. control. Sorry, one more. <laughs> and no, how no, long, no. and do these property, the properties that are held, um, if I were to do that strategy, do I have to hold the properties for a certain amount of months before they? I would consider doing uh, the blanket strategy? Like, do I have? Do they have to be seasoned, or they can just as long as they have equity in them, um, either through renovations or just because I brought it low, and the value of the home and the areas are are comping higher? Do they look at that, or does it matter? On the, on the residential side, yes. So on the residential side, most lenders will not look at your new market value until you've made 12 mortgage payments. So if you buy a house and you put a new kitchen in it and six months later you go to your, another lender and you're like, hey, I've been here, I put a new kitchen in it. My neighbor sold for 60 grand more than I did and I put a kitchen in it so I think it's worth 100. They don't care. They look at the sale price of the house for the first 12 months. On the commercial side, uh, it's lender by lender, but a lot of lenders don't have seasoning periods on the commercial side. You just want to speak to your lender, confirm. Some do. I mean, I'd say it's probably 50-50. I see seasoning periods on the commercial side. They're shorter. They're like six months sometimes, but um, I've worked with a lot of lenders that don't have seasoning periods on the commercial side. So, you know, I could buy a property. I mean, I just did one in Collingdale. We bought a row home and I mean, the job was so, it was like a, it was less than a 30 day renovation and we had it rented and refied within two months of buying it. And we bought it for a hundred, we got 180 K renovation or ARV on the refi because it's under the commercial. And that's, this lender didn't have a ceasing period, of course. So, um, so it's lender by lender and way more flexible on the commercial side. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, Absolutely. So has anyone here used any of these strategies before? Have you used any of them? Uh, okay. 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 You said you did a deed in lieu. How'd that go? Easy. Okay. Bank had already, I mean, they were, they were handling everything. Bank was in Florida. And the property, uh, the property was... At one point, it was listed at the time at 79 knots. They did a grass and grass and price reduction to 39. Mm. And I picked up the Wow. It's all one bedroom car. Yes. And uh, they had five people living in one bedroom. Right. Wow. Uh, and so, but it was it was a painless process. It was like it was like settling on a book. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I know a fund that does basically just calling banks for these deed in lieu type situations. And they're doing some pretty big ones. They're doing like a 3.9 million reno in the city. Yeah. This guy bought a, a section of a um, brewery town and did a 13 unit condo building. Problem is it took longer than he thought. So his balloon showed up and all of a sudden he can't afford the payments and the bank was about to default on it. So this fund reached out to them to purchase it. And they're just trying to sell it deed in lieu before they actually have to, to close on it. And I think they're going to be able to do it. So, and it's painful because you know, I put two, three years of his life into that project and, you know, you know, it's, he's going to make nothing, you know? So, but that's the risk oh. it takes. You have to be careful. Um, and those happen pretty often and i think by 2026 we're gonna see even more of them because around 22 is when the rates started to go up so around 21 is when most people were still getting their lower rates and most commercial loans are five one arms like you're most people don't lock into 
25 or 20 or 30 year commercials, they're amortized over that period, but the bank wants you to refi every five years. So they usually put them on five one arms. So if you did a five one arm, like I have a property in Potsdown that I'm trying to 10, I'm going to 1031 because we refied in 2021, 2026. I know where the rate's going to be and it's not going to be making me enough money. So I'm trying to sell it now before that happens, you know? Um, so I think around 26, we're going to see a lot of those situations, a lot more. Hmm? You also see, so my thinking is, so, I mean, people generally, I, I feel like as a rule of thumb, you know, when they buy a property, they refinance in five to seven years. So for those people who have bought at like these seven plus percent interest rates and have paid these overinflated prices, five years from now, when they go to refinance and maybe they're not the best equity position, they could be upside down. Um, do you see that also affecting um, foreclosure rates and, and whatnot? Depends on what market you're talking about. If you're talking about the investor market, multifamily, possibly. If you're talking about residential real estate in Delaware County, Montgomery County, even Chester County, there's not a whole lot of land left to be built on. I mean, there's none in Delco, I can tell you that. So it's supply and demand. There's a ton of demand and no supply for residential in Delaware County and Montgomery County. Bucks County, there's more land, but it's super expensive. Chester County, I mean, areas like uh, Lincoln University, where you could buy a giant house on an acre for 450, that house is now 900, and it's not going anywhere. And the city of Philadelphia is becoming more of a, they're trying to become significantly more of a, a public transit. That's why they're trying to put the basketball team in the center city and they're redoing Penn's Landing and they're redoing the entire industrial complex that burned down uh, around Southwest, that whole section. They're trying to force people to not drive, which is going to have to create the infrastructure for trains to come into the city. Uh, so people are going to be able to live further out from the city because you really can't afford or find housing within a 30 minute radius of the city anymore. Even you go into Cherry Hill, look at the prices because of what you have to pay to get close to the city. So I don't think those areas are going to be affected as heavily as some of the like uh, artificially inflated markets that happened during COVID, you know, like the markets people flock to. You know, the Pocono region is, is hurting right now. I know a lot of people that did a bunch of Airbnbs in the Poconos and they're not really filling up the summer, you know, and or the people that were, you know, living there because they could have worked commuter. The city is asking employers, cities are asking employers to bring their people back to work. Why? Because if the city's empty, nobody's making money, right? All of those restaurants, all of those shops they're losing money and the city is losing tax dollars so you wonder why employees are calling people back it's not because they have to or need to it's because they're you know they're being we're kind of required to to keep the economies going in these cities so those areas that got artificially inflated i think those are ones you're going to see the hurt and it's already happening i mean austin is down 25 percent uh sections of florida are hurting you know like there's you're seeing it. All the few places that people like just went to like crazy during COVID, they're hurting. Our market in my, I mean, our market is Pennsylvania, the number one employer in Pennsylvania are healthcare. So as long as the healthcare market doesn't change, like that's really the biggest economical factor that could happen around here or in most of Pennsylvania. If something happens with that, I could see our market hurting quite a bit. Um, I just, it's not this blanket thing anymore where it's mortgages affecting, it's just individual markets affecting. And like the markets that were big tech hubs, they're hurting because tech jobs are, people are being laid off in kind of large numbers from tech jobs. So those markets are hurting, but that's an economical factor. It's not a overall everything's hurting factor. So to answer your question shorter, no, not in the residential market. In the, I think there's gonna be the normal amount of foreclosures. That number dropped drastically because they paused it during COVID. There was the foreclosure moratorium. It's been coming back up. It's still not even back to normal yet. I think by 25, 26, it'll be back to normal. And, you know, there's always going to be 
you know, cur waves in the market, but I don't think it's going to be an abnormal number around here until something affects our, our local economy. But yeah, for the landlords, it's different, right? Because if you're evaluating a multifamily property based on the profit and your mortgage payment is here, not here, yeah, you're, 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 you're going to hurt. Yeah. What else? Any other questions? This yeah, well, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, just backing up a little bit, I did do a subject to, I'm not sure if we had a conversation about that at one point. Nice. But um, my question was, after getting into the subject two and going through refining the property, getting it into the LLC's name, um, how does is it how does the tax portion of it go? Um, because I had a little I had a little it was kind of cloudy when I was doing it because um, the previous owner had it for a portion of the year and I had it for a portion of the year. You mean the property tax, like the school tax? Property taxes. Yeah. So like, is that usually something that, um, you, what is subject to you as the, uh, person taking over the property should be paying the portion of the year that you lived there or you owned it. Right. So, if they owned it to July and that's when you took over the the mortgage payment and took over the property, then you should be the one responsible from July on. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and so as far as the mortgage payments go and proving that you were the one that was making the mortgage payments. Um, so I guess, so if you didn't set up a trust, because I, I I heard you were talking about the trust, but if you didn't set up a trust, but you faithfully made the payments and everything went through fine, um, proving that you were the one that made the mortgage payment, because obviously it's not in your name. Mm -hmm. Is that as simple as showing bank statements? It should be. But I guess like, why would you, what would be the, the need for that? Is that because on the, re when you're, when you're, when you're buying it out, they're asking for that? No, just, um, you know, basically sound sleep at night because after you, oh. you, you file taxes and, yeah. and, and you know, you claim certain things or whatever, but yeah, just to make sure that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. Like, yeah, no, that's a good, that's something a good CPA would be able to do for you. <laughs> so okay. Okay. definitely want like your accountant's, tracking that and ask your account like what's the what's the proper way to do this you set up a separate account for it should it be coming from your regular bill account all that um but yeah if you have a a good account and once you start doing this stuff like unless you're an accountant yourself i don't really recommend doing your own taxes i think <laughs> it's worth it this point start yeah one just to keep you out of trouble um yeah you know the other thing is peace of mind it's just like you know a lot of the times i say this to like for sale by owners, but I'm like, you know, if, if you have an agent and someone sues, they're probably going to sue the agent first. Their brokerage has more insurance than you do. You know, same thing with the CPA. Like your, uh, if your CPA messes up, it's on it, you, you know, you don't have to pay the difference, but the penalties and stuff could be on them, you know? So it's just that peace of mind knowing you have that extra coverage. Yeah. And get a good one. I mean, I've been to like, or years ago, I was at like an H and R block, and I was asking a question, and I I could see her camera screen, and she was googling the answer, and I'm like, uh, I could do this, you know. So get a good one that doesn't have to Google the answer. Well, I'm looking for one. If uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, my CPA Philly, that's the company I use. Karen Anderson. Um, okay, she's great, pretty in inexpensive, uh, and I don't really have to ask many questions. Nice. Yeah. I'll, I'll look her up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my second question, and then I'm I'm done. Um, <laughs> okay. How does how does DTI play a role in private lending when you're doing um, the creative financing bit? Uh, do does that weigh heavily? Does do you find it where people take that into account, um, or is that something that's usually not taken into account by most? 
private lending situations. It's called something different in commercial slash private lending. They call it DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. Their biggest concern is that you're at a 1.25 or above debt service coverage ratio, meaning the income from that property is more than 25% or 0.25 higher than the overall expenses. Uh, so that's okay. that's really what they're looking at in the commercial side is that your debt to income on your personal side could be you know, fairly high as long as they know and the reason they're doing that is because they want to know, again, if they take it back, they're able to afford holding this property without losing money before they sell it, right? Um, so when banks are evaluating commercial, they look at the debt service coverage ratio. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Great questions. Great questions. Well, coming up on eight. This was awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Hope to see you all next month. You know, it's my favorite one. That's Burr. That's my uh, bread and butter. That's how I have all my my rental properties. So I'll have some real life examples, um, some more up to date examples of projects I've done since I've did the last uh, Burr Strat Burr seminar. So hope to see you all there. Thanks again. Absolutely. I don't want to